Bell. All right, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and um, I, I went to school as far as college, and I made it through high school, and still doing the right thing, just still being in that, that young mindset, I still kind of got swayed away into the life that what we believe, you know, from the media, the stuff we see in our environment, that we think that th this is the way. And as um, far as I can say through my comments, it's been good and it's been bad as far as some people say, well, how did, how did, how did you go through school and you, you, you've been in the game? And a lot of people get confused and, you know, a lot of people think it's all bad, but it, it, it's just not as bad. You know, it's good, it's good people still in that, but it's still bad things that happen. And that's through ignorance, you know. And I can say through their comments, um, I made it through. You know, I could I could have been doing a lot of time. I could have been dead, but, you know, I'm, I'm still here and I'm very blessed to be here, you know. And I'm 31 years old. You know, I have uh, two sons and a daughter. Mm. And um, I try to tell them every day, you know, the things you see on TV, the Internet, Facebook, all that, it's not, it's not what it seems, you know. It's, it's, it's an illusion. Mm. It's an illusion. And it's, and, and it's really hard for, you know, young people to um, get through that illusion. And um, that's pretty much what I can say about myself with that mm. illusion, you mm. know. It's, 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 it's crazy, you know. It, it can sweep you up. It can really sweep you up. Because I got swept up in it, you know. And it just took time through growing to where, you know, you, you change. And see, a lot of people get confused that, you know, changing and growing is two different things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I like to just leave off right there. Uh, Mr. Harris, why don't you uh, give us yes. some information in reference to your situation? My name is Dwayne Harris. I'm from South Central Los Angeles. And um, I'm a former gang member, front and gang leader. Um, I have two sons that was murdered in Los Angeles. Um, and it's a shame that, um, that our kids are killing with no remorse. You know, it, like, like my brother said, it, it's, it's illusion, it's ignorance, but it's that um, our system and stuff don't, don't teach them. We don't have enough men to really teach these young guys how to be men, you know? They, they're misled, misrepresent, and it's hard to get them to stop selling these drugs and stuff when McDonald's won't hire them, and we keep saying, you need to stop doing this and stop doing that, but we ain't trying to show them what they need to do or take the time out to really understand what they're going through. Mm -hmm. You know, see, we done lost the whole concept of our community and our black people and our young people, man. They, they don't know how to respect the older people, and they, the older people don't know how to respect the younger people. Very good. And of course, let's take Ms. Greenlee this first commercial break and then we'll get back and we'll have Ms. Greenlee to start us off in this eight minute segment. And we'll be back with our audience following this uh, short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the uh, second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Ms. Greenlee, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Bell, uh, three members uh, of the uh, audience, I mean of the panel, who uh, have uh, had some tragedies in uh, their lives and uh, Ms. Bell, uh, Ms. Greenlee thought that uh, they could pull this organization together and call it Save Our Sons in recognition to the fact that uh, some of them have lost children in, uh, to the violence that we face today. Let's talk about it from that perspective, Ms. Greenlee. Yes, Dr. Haney, you know, for, for a long time, everybody know me as uh, the program I also have called Moms, Mothers Over Murder. I've always had mothers and grandmothers and aunties and sisters crying. And uh, me, the mother of a murdered son, myself, Rodriguez Greenlee, 2003, uh, I really felt lost that I didn't have the father to stand here with me because he had a loss too. This is the first time ever that I've had two fathers to stand here with me and talk about what this means to them as a father uh, of a 
murdered son. If we don't get to the point of saying, what can we do about it instead of the pointing the fingers and the blaming, then we're not ever going to find a solution to this. You know, I sit here also with you this morning because I want to say Mark, March the 23rd, which will be coming up the following Monday, would mark a year for me burying my 18-year-old nephew. And then I lost an 18-year-old grandson all in one year last year. So this is really going to came to a point in my life where I got to keep speaking up as a female being out in the trenches mm -hmm. and also knocking on doors saying, help me, help me so we can guide our youth. This is what I'm talking about. I need the fathers to stand up and to help me, help me guide our youth. These young men need to hear from the mother and the grandmother, but they need to be led by the father oh, and the okay. grandfathers. And so I have a plea that I'm asking all fathers, listen to these two daddies up here and this young young man that's just now becoming a father and here they plead to come out and stand with us because it's about us guiding these young people, not pointing our fingers at them. Very good. Now, Mr. Harris, what's your story? Well, um, like we were speaking of, I lost two sons. They both was murdered. Um, and it's so hard to for forgive. You never forget. But then when I abolish my lifestyle, I try to learn to forgive, but also it, it, it's hard for the, for the kids in the street to, to forgive different situations, different scenarios that happen, you know, the tragedy they go through. So as men and as black men, we got to learn how to teach our youngs to, even when you experience different, different tragedies or different things, you have to have someone there to be for. The men need to learn how to teach the young boys to be a man. We need the women to teach the women, the young girls, how to be a, the, a woman. You understand what I'm saying? So this is, it, it's not easy. It's not easy for me. Sitting here, I, it's hard mm -hmm. for me to say, I really forgave the people that killed my sons would be a lot. But, and, and through the tragedy and everything, I'm learning. So this is what we got. It's all a learning process. I'm new to this, but I'm willing to give it 100%. Thanks to Ms. Greenleaf, I, I understand my calling. And this is what I'm here for to try to teach my young men a better life, a better lifestyle. You know, you, you're responsible for your own choices, you know, but if you have somebody to help you with them choices, it's 100% better. And so you lost two children to uh, gun violence yes, in California. Yes, they was murdered. Yes. Actually murdered. murdered. You don't want to yes. uh, make it sound like a, a nice, no, they, uh, they, uh, sanitized kind of no, thing. It was no, they murder. were slaughtered in the street. Uh, slaughtered in yes. the streets of, of yes. California. It is hurt. It hurts. Mm. 2007 Father Day. In, in April the 3rd, uh, 2003. Um, Young children? 15, or? both was murdered at 15 years old. Never experienced life, you know, never understood life. But see, that's, that's what we go through when we, when we being misled in these streets and, and, and as young kids, we not really knowing what we're doing. We're taking up on diabolical things that we're doing. We're hurting our mothers, our fathers, you know? We're hurting our loved ones. And we, it's no one there really teach them a better lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that's what my hope in this program here would, would be able to reach out and touch Because you didn't have boot camp and all no, that. No, we didn't have nothing there growing up. All that's abolished, you know, uh, from us when um, we try to reach out. There wasn't no program like Ms. Greenleaf have, you know, mm -hmm. Nazareth Peacemaker. Wasn't none of that, none of that around for us. But uh, in, in the other community it was, not in the black community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, Mr. Bell, you're trying to prevent situations like this from happening to your children. Is that what, 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 you, what, what are you telling them now, Mr. Bell? Uh, yes, very well. I, I don't. I don't want my sons to be victims of that. And every day, I do my best to be there for them. And um, by me being there, you know, I try to have a structured lifestyle. You know, go to work, try to come home, help them with their homework, be in tune with them, instead of me just being out doing the stuff I used to do. You know, being caught up in that lifestyle. And um, I want them to be better men, and by them being better men, I try to tell them, you know, don't do it like this. Don't, don't, don't listen to your buddies at school. You know, come talk to me because I've been there and done that. And you know, a lot of youngsters think, oh, you just, oh, you really don't know. No, you don't know. Mm -hmm. You see, I've been there, and you know, and and it's hard when 
when I was gone, being you know locked up for a period of time, you know they asked me like, where were you at? And I had to tell them I was on a job run or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to have to go back and do that. You know, it it, it hurts talking you know, to my daughter, you know, yeah. and my son through a glass. And, you know, I don't want them being that, you know, because it was one time, you know, I cried on my bunk, you know, I said, my children should not go through this, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's all from being just misled mm -hmm. with the choices, you know, because, you know, when you're young, you don't, you don't know no better. It's the, it's, the, it's the worst experience, you know, if you don't have nobody there and the, and the, and the proper love to reach out to show you instead of just beating you down. Mm -hmm beat you down, not giving you no hope, not giving you nothing to grab on. So, you know, you really have to give them something to, hey, I got something to live for. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see the light, you know, somebody's there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ms. Greenlee, uh, mm. in a real sense, uh -huh. uh, the, the men play a significant role. That's what you're saying over the last minute that we have here, play a significant role in as long as we can hear their stories. Mm -hmm. And I think that these two uh, gentlemen, uh, both uh, Mr. Harris as well as Mr. Bill, Bill have real stories. He t him yes. talking about his incarceration and looking through the glass at yes. uh, his relatives and picking up the telephone on one side yes. and then on the other side. That's some, some, some of the things that you don't want your children to go through. No. And had you been able to perhaps save your children, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Harris, you probably would have done uh, something yeah. different yes, than what, yes, what you've done. And so that's, that's essentially what we want to talk about as we come down to this final segment, I mean the final few minutes of this particular segment and we appreciate the two of you giving us that information and we'll be back with our audience following this very very short commercial break Thank you and welcome back to the uh, final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Ms. Greenlee and uh, Mr. Howard, uh, both who have given us, uh, Ms. Greenlee has given us some excellent information in reference to an organization called Save Our Sons. And Mr. Howard has some additional information to give in reference to his own personal experiences with the uh, death of uh, his, one of his children or his child. And of course, Ms. Greenlee, uh, why don't you say some things in reference to uh, how the uh, uh, fathers are able to play a significant role in terms of helping us to somehow deal with all of these problems with youth violence and murder and et cetera, and then allow Mr. Uh, Howard to uh, give us some information in reference to his own personal experiences. Yes, uh, Dr. Haney, for the years that I've been out here in the community, I've seen over and over and over, even going to funerals, that it, it, the fathers play a huge part in being uh, uh, absent from, from our children and our youth. When we go to the funerals, everybody always come to us, but I know that for a fact that there's been fathers that have been sitting there next to the mother, but no one knows anything about them or they voice, and you just like, oh ma'am, I'm so sorry what happened, and then you pass on. Mm -hmm. And that father needs to be touched also mm -hmm. and say, sir, I really feel your pain, or I'm sorry this happened to you, but the fathers won't step up, and I don't know why, and I mean, I'm hoping that these men that I've brought with me today that will help uh, bring that up forth. This young man here sitting to my right now, Mr. Howard, he's a hard-working man out in the community, been out there for years, and when I got a phone call about him and his tragedy, it struck me, and it really touched my heart, and I had to reach out to him once again. Very good. Mr. Howard, why don't you tell us something about your own personal experiences in reference to this? Uh, well, I've been working in the community for like the last 11 years through my own organization. It's called Personal Interest in Changing Character because my interest was personal. You know, I spent 20 years out here in these streets, you know, doing the things that we did because we got caught up, you know, from I went to college. So I'm college, ed I'm college educated, but I got caught up in a lifestyle and it kind of took me away from my family, but I still was still to raise my kids. Now, after I was incarcerated, I came out here and I had the need to just make a change for myself and these young men who struggled in life from lack of opportunity, lack of hope. And uh, uh, so it's been a uh, you know, tough 10 years, but recently uh, that whole struggle, that whole hopelessness, that whole lack of opportunity, you know, hit home. My son, Jawan Booker, was murdered a month ago. 
okay? And we buried him three weeks ago, okay? So, so even though I'm feeling the anger and the frustration, you know, I'm still out here to do the work because these young men need to hold on to more than just what these streets have to offer, mm. you know? These streets don't have too much to offer, you know? You need to get these, these young men some opportunities, uh, some hope to do something different than what they're already doing. And so you got a personal testimony, and, and as you said, uh, the, the whole thing sort of came home to, to you when it happens, things that you've been trying to prevent from happening to youth for the longest, for the 10 years, all of a sudden they, you get the uh, word that uh, something mm -hmm. has happened to your child. What, what, what was your first uh, feeling in reference to that, uh, Mr. Howell? My first feeling was anger, frustration, you know, uh, hopelessness, because I couldn't do nothing myself. Because you'd yeah. already yeah. talked to him about it, well, undoubtedly. Well, well, I mean, I talked to him about it, and sometimes, you know, it's just the wrong place, wrong time, okay? And, 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 and you know, my son was a good kid, but, but, you know, he had his issues as well, but he had tried to make a difference in his life, you know. Uh, he was taking care of his family, you know, working, doing everything that he should do. But always, when you change, the streets don't change with you. Mm. So whatever came with that, sometimes, you know, it, it comes back to you. You know, it's kind of the chicken come home to roost. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's unfortunate, you know. It's a struggle daily, but, uh, you know, I know that I can still continue to make a difference. And though I lost my son, somebody may not have to lose theirs. But with some of the things that you might be able to say or some of the things you might be able to do, you can prevent that from happening to others. Yes, sir. Is that the general way that folks feel in reference to that, Ms. Greenlee? Speak to that. Yes, uh, exactly. Um, you know, I was kind of out there in the streets doing this before my son was murdered, just like uh, Mr. Uh, Howard. So, but it gives you more passion to really want to get out there mm. to stop that next bullet for that next child right. or just that innocent grown per right. person that can be just coming out the door again right. until we address the the plentifulness of the guns that's coming into our right. whole low-income neighborhoods right. we we can talk about the gangs the bad use all day long but we need to start also focusing back on how they're really getting these guns. I could say uh, my son would have been still here if it wasn't for him getting, you know, them having that gun. Uh, I, we need to talk about why we don't have opportunities, why every time something go on in our community, it get cut, low budget cut, uh, campsites get cut, free lunch get cut, uh, any job kind program. of job program get cut. Why we always be the one to get chopped down? Now, right. I'm, I'm asking everybody, the system, elected officials and all, to just come together. And yeah, I do like the movie, uh, Tyler Perry have our haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. But see, uh, as one of the young men said, that's an illusion that's going on. But that's a true story. And this is how the system got us living. You know, it's sad because how I can go down one street and say, oh, look at those beautiful homes. <laughs> And I turned on one little block and like, damn, it's a third world country. Yeah. So why do we have to keep on being divided like that? So until we talk about socializing and socioeconomics here with our kids again, and, and let me just say this, Dr. Haney, when are we going to get bold enough where we're going to start talking about this in schools, library, churches, yeah, right. and just in open tables at home? We don't even have dinner at the table anymore. Everybody eating over there, everybody eating upstairs, and some people don't eat at home. I think until they let us start speaking on this and, and letting us, you know, one Sunday a month, let us come into church and talk about youth gang, teen pregnancy, drugs, yeah. all of these guns. You know, my um my my step grandson would still be here. The young man had the gun. And he accidentally killed him. But where did he get the gun? So until we start talk, talk, you know talking about other things other than gang member this and that and um and not the solution, we just gonna keep on having these conversations. Right. Mr. Mr. Howard, what would you say in reference to uh, trying to convince and say some other words to our young people? Well, uh, the uh, young people, they got a saying, you know, what I mean that I'm ready to die. Mm -hmm. But I want to challenge all young people to just, you know, find something that you want to live for. Ready to live. Uh, and live for that. You mm -hmm. know, it's more to it than just coming out here and dying for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 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 and, and the uh, greatest thing out here is, is a lot of times these, these streets offer a sense of belonging, mm -hmm. a sense of opportunity, whereas 
you know, we don't have no job programs. We don't have nowhere for the, uh, the young 